I brought a timer this time, and uh, as Father already said, my lecture tonight is entitled The Papacy and the Passion of the Church. If I did not believe God, I would be convinced that the Catholic Church was about to end. These are the words of Monsignor Joseph Clifford Fenton, written in his personal diary on November 23rd, 1962, approximately six weeks after the opening of the Second Vatican Council, in which he was participating as a theological expert. What has happened to the Catholic Church? Ladies and gentlemen, this is a question that not a few people have asked themselves since the death of of Pope Pius XII on October 9th, 1958. In fact, any objective observer would have to agree that nothing has been the same since. At this point, after 58 full years, the only resemblance to the church of Pius XII and his predecessors that the institution in Vatican City bears is the buildings and some externals that are few and far between. Only the outer shell of Catholicism has been retained and the inside has been replaced with a toxic mix of heresy, blasphemy, and impiety. But we ask ourselves, how could this be? Did our blessed Lord not promise to St. Peter that he would be the rock on which the church was to be built and that the gates of hell would not prevail against it? A common theological maxim says, where Peter is, there is the church. And the church is infallible and indefectible, the ark of salvation, which everyone must join if he wishes to be saved. So let's first take a look at what the Catholic Church teaches about the nature and the purpose of the papacy and what consequences result from it. In an allocution given on March 7th, 1873, Pope Pius IX explained the intrinsic connection between the faith and the office of the papacy. Quote, Such was Peter's faith. Such must be our own. Faith was the strongest characteristic of the prince of the apostles. This it was which made him answer Christ, Thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. This it was which won for him the title of blessed. Blessed art thou, because neither flesh nor blood has put on your lips the confession of my divinity, but because it is my eternal Father who has revealed it to you from heaven. From this comes the order establishing Peter as the foundation of the church. Unquote. The faith of St. Peter was guaranteed by Christ himself never to fail. Our Lord said to St. Peter in St. Luke's Gospel, chapter 22, verses 31 and 32, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not, and thou, being once converted, confirm thy brethren. But this gift of unfailing faith did not die with St. Peter. Just as with the Petrine primacy itself, the gift of never-failing faith endures in all of his valid successors. This was taught by the First Vatican Council, promulgated by Pope Pius IX in 1870. Quote, So this gift of truth and never-failing faith was divinely conferred upon Peter and his successors in this chair, that they might administer their high duty for the salvation of all that the entire flock of Christ, turned away by them from the poisonous food of error, might be nourished on the sustenance of heavenly doctrine, that which the occasion of schism removed, the whole church might be saved as one, and relying on her foundation might stay firm against the gates of hell. In 1742, Pope Benedict XIV summarized Catholic teaching about the nature of the Roman pontificate as follows. Quote, The holy apostolic see and the Roman pontiff have primacy in the entire world. The Roman pontiff is the successor of blessed Peter, the prince of the apostles, true vicar of Christ, 
head of the whole church, father and teacher of all Christians, unquote. In 1853, Pope Pius IX taught the following in his encyclical letter, Inter Multiplicius. Quote, this chair of Peter is the center of Catholic truth and unity, that is, the head, mother, and teacher of all the churches to which all honor and obedience must be offered. Every church must agree with it because of its greater preeminence. Now you know well that the most deadly foes of the Catholic religion have always waged a fierce war, but without success, against this chair. They are by no means ignorant of the fact that religion itself can never totter and fall while this chair remains intact. The chair which rests on the rock which the proud gates of hell cannot overthrow and in which there is the whole and perfect solidity of the Christian religion, unquote. And the first Vatican Council in 1870 made this dogmatic pronouncement. Quote, if anyone thus speaks that the Roman pontiff has only the office of inspection or direction, but not the full and supreme power of jurisdiction over the universal church, not only in things which pertain to faith and morals, but also in those which pertain to the discipline and government of the church spread over the whole world, or that he possesses only the more important parts, but not the whole plenitude of the supreme power, or that this power of his is not ordinary and immediate, or over the churches altogether and individually, and over the pastors and the faithful altogether and individually, let him be anathema. Unquote. Thus we see expounded the nature of the papacy. The pope is the universal teacher of Christendom. He is the supreme judge of all the faithful. He's the vicar of Christ who governs all and to whom everyone must submit. He is the principle of unity. He is the divinely instituted guarantee of the true faith in the true church. Understanding the nature of the papacy, we can easily see its purpose. To ensure that sound doctrine will always be taught in the universal church and especially in the See of Rome to maintain the unity of all the members of the church, to rule the church with the authority of Christ by binding and loosing. In short, the purpose of the papacy is to keep the gates of hell from prevailing against the church. And it is clear that Christ endowed the office of the papacy he himself founded with all the guarantees and heavenly aid necessary to attain its purpose. Christ Jesus himself, then, guarantees the papacy. And he does this regardless of who the occupant of the papal office is at any given point in time. As Popes Leo XII and Pius IX taught, the papacy does not fail even in an unworthy heir. Likewise, Pope Leo XIII taught this, quote, The church has received from on high a promise which guarantees her against every human weakness. What does, what does it matter that the helm of the symbolic bark has been entrusted to feeble hands when the divine pilot stands on the bridge where, though invisible, he is watching and ruling? Unquote. It would be absurd indeed if the office of the papacy could either fail or succeed depending on who currently happens to be pope as though it were based on the personal qualifications, charisma, or merits of the occupant, rather than on the institution by and promises of Jesus Christ. This would defeat the purpose of the church and make her indistinguishable from any human institution. It would make the pope indistinguishable from any other human leader. But if all this is so then a number of things follow, both in theory and in practice. The first consequence that follows from this is that we have an obligation to submit with our intellect and will to the Roman pontiff, and this as a matter of our eternal salvation. This indeed is Catholic dogma, defined by Pope Boniface VIII in 1302 
and his bull, Unam Sanctum. Quote, we declare, we proclaim, we define that it is absolutely necessary for salvation that every human creature be subject to the Roman pontiff, unquote. Secondly, it also follows from this that we have a divine guarantee that we will never stray from sound doctrine as long as we are united with the Holy See under the Pope. Pope Leo XIII put it quite succinctly in his encyclical Satis Conitum, where he taught, quote, Union with the Roman See of Peter is always the public criterion of a Catholic. You are not to be looked upon as holding the true Catholic faith if you do not, te- ta- excuse me, if you do not teach that the faith of Rome is to be held, unquote. Likewise, Pope Pius IX said, quote, One simple way to keep men professing Catholic truth is to maintain their communion with and obedience to the Roman pontiff. For it is impossible for a man ever to reject any portion of the Catholic faith without abandoning the authority of the Roman church. In this authority, the unalterable teaching office of this faith lives on. It was set up by the divine redeemer, and consequently, the tradition from the apostles has always been preserved, unquote. Now, notice how Pius IX mentions here that the preservation of apostolic tradition is a consequence of the papacy having been established by Christ. Once again, we see that the papacy guarantees orthodoxy, and it does this by divine institution. It cannot fail regardless of who currently happens to be pope and regardless of any other circumstance. So from all, the, from all the foregoing, we can see how important the Pope question is. Many who call themselves traditional Catholics think that the issue of whether the papal claimants after Pius XII are true popes or not is peripheral, perhaps even unimportant or, in any case, just a matter of opinion, as though nothing followed from accepting or rejecting these men's claims to the papacy. But looking at what the church teaches about the nature, purpose, and consequences of the papacy, we can see how mistaken and dangerous such an attitude is. Indeed, all the uh, church teaching that I've quoted so far is inherently incompatible with the idea that a true pope could be a heretic, a public heretic. If such a thing were possible, Catholic teaching on the papacy would be reduced to absurdity. The vicar of Christ would become the vicar of Satan, and the church, which is the ark of salvation, would turn into a vehicle for damnation, which we might say is actually a pretty apt description of the Vatican II church and its current captain, Jorge Bergoglio, which alone suffices to prove that it is not the Catholic church and its head is not the pope. For if it is true that where Peter is, there is the church, then it is likewise true that where the church is not, there Peter is not either. Describing the Catholic Church as the mystical body of Christ, Pope Pius XII explained that, quote, it is the will of Jesus Christ that the whole body of the church, no less than the individual members, should resemble him. What wonder, then, if, while on this earth, she, like Christ, suffer persecutions, insults, and sorrows? Unquote. As we all know, our blessed Lord suffered the ultimate persecution, insults, and sorrows in his sacred passion on Holy Thursday and Good Friday. And indeed, sacred tradition tells us that Holy Mother Church, too, will undergo her very own mystical passion, before Christ returns in glory. Like her divine spouse, the Catholic Church will undergo every kind of persecution and humiliation. And like him, she will seem, for a time, to have failed. But not until the appointed time. No one was able to harm our Lord until the precise moment in time when he willed it. 
And so also the persecution of the church could not begin until the precise moment predetermined by God from all eternity. So it is very important for us to understand that the passion of the church was prophesied ahead of time just as our Lord prophesied his own passion to his disciples. Quote, At present I tell you, before it come to pass, that when it shall come to pass, you may believe that I am he. Unquote. And that was John thirteen nineteen. Just as the passion of our Lord was the ultimate consequence of people rejecting him and his teachings, so the passion of the church will likewise be the final consequence of people revolting against her authority, her mission, and her teaching. One of the central texts in sacred scripture dealing with this is the second letter of St. Paul to the Thessalonians, chapter 2. Let me quote to you verses 3 through 11. Let no man deceive you by any means, for unless there come a revolt first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition who opposeth and is lifted up above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself as if he were God. Remember you not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? And now you know what withholdeth, that he may be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity already worketh, only that he who now holdeth do hold until he be taken out of the way. And then that wicked one shall be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus shall kill with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, him whose coming is according to the working of Satan, in all power and signs and lying wonders, and in all seduction of iniquity, to them that perish, because they receive not the love of truth that they might be saved. Therefore, God shall send them the operation of error to believe lying, that all may be judged who have not believed the truth but have consented to iniquity. That again was 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 through 11. This passage reveals a number of important things that pertain to the passion of the church. St. Paul explains that already in his time, there was underway what he calls the mystery of iniquity, which is the cause of this revolt against the church. They are the forces of Antichrist, which seek to draw away as many souls from Christ as possible. And one way they will do this is through what St. Paul calls the operation of error, a great deception that God will allow to be inflicted on all who do not love the truth, but instead prefer to remain in sin. This revolt of the mystery of iniquity will culminate in the revelation of the man of sin, the Antichrist, who will seduce and deceive almost everyone by means of false miracles. But, and this is a really significant point, even though this mystery of iniquity was already at work in the first century, St. Paul says that there is a restraining force in place that holds it back, holds it back from succeeding against the church, but only for a predetermined time until this restraining force is taken out of the way. But what or who is this restraining force? According to the church fathers and other great Catholic theologians, that which holds back the mystery of iniquity from prevailing against the church is the papacy. The pope, not any particular pope, but the pope as such, is what keeps the Antichrist forces from conquering the church. But only for a time. Only until he be taken out of the way, as St. Paul says. What will happen then? Again, Holy Scripture gives us the answer. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered. The prophet Zechariah tells us in chapter 13, verse 7, and our Lord used this very verse 
to warn his disciples on the night of his passion that they would be scandalized in him because he, the shepherd, would be struck. And that's in uh, Matthew 26, 31. How might this striking of the shepherd actually take place? Here it will be helpful to turn to the book of the Apocalypse, chapter 12, verses 1 through 5. There we read the following, quote, And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. And being with child, she cried travailing in birth and was in pain to be delivered. And there was seen another sign in heaven, and behold a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and on his head seven diadems. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to be delivered, that when she should be, when she should be delivered, he might devour her son. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with an iron rod, and her son was taken up to God and to his throne. Again, that's Apocalypse chapter 12, verses 1 through 5. At first sight, this passage may not seem to have anything to do with what we're talking about, but actually it does. By 1955, Father Herman Bernard Kramer, a diocesan priest from Iowa, had studied the apocalypse for 30 years and published the fruits of his labor under the title, The Book of Destiny. In it, he explains that this passage talks about the church passing at that time through the greatest crisis of her whole life. Here's what he says, quote, In that travail, she gives birth to some definite person who is to rule the church with a rod of iron. It then points to a conflict waged within the church to elect one who was to rule all nations in the manner clearly stated. In accord with the text, this is unmistakably a papal election, for only Christ and his vicar have the divine right to rule all nations. Furthermore, The church does not travail in anguish at every papal election, which can be held without trouble or danger. But at this time, the great powers may take a menacing attitude to hinder the election of the logical and expected candidate by threats of a general apostasy, assassination, or imprisonment of this candidate if elected. This would suppose an extremely hostile mind in the governments of Europe towards the church, and it would cause intense anguish to the church because an extended interregnum in the papacy is always disastrous, and more so in a time of universal persecution. If Satan would contrive to hinder a papal election, the church would suffer great travail. As a dragon, Satan, through the evil world powers of that time, will enter the church interfere with her liberty, and perhaps by stealthy suggestions, having long before directed the choosing of candidates for the episcopate, will now endeavor by threats of force to hinder the election of the worthiest candidate for the papacy. Unquote. Remember now, Father Kramer wrote this in 1955. He did not have knowledge of future events. He simply interpreted the apocalypse in accordance with Catholic tradition, and in light of world events up until that time. But the main point here is not so much how Father Kramer thought a papal election might be hindered or a pope kept from exercising his office, but the very fact that he brings up an extended interregnum, time without a pope, at all, as well as the possibility of a general apostasy in connection with it. But Father Kramer was by no means the only one to interpret the the 12th chapter of the Apocalypse in this way. Father E. Sylvester Berry essentially said the same thing as far back as 1921. Quote, In this passage, Apocalypse 12, there is an evident allusion to some particular son of the church 
whose power and influence shall be such that Satan will seek his destruction at any cost. This person can be none other than the Pope to be elected in those days. The papacy will be attacked by all the powers of hell. In consequence, the church will suffer great trials and afflictions in securing a successor upon the throne of Peter. Unquote. That's from his book, The Apocalypse of St. John, which was published in 1921. So there is the scenario of the struck shepherd and the scattered sheep applied as recently as the 20th century. However, a struck shepherd and scattered sheep are one thing, yet they alone do not yet constitute that operation of error that will make people believe lying, as St. Paul says. In St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24, our blessed Lord warns that there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch as to deceive, if possible, even the elect. That's Matthew 24, 24. In other words, the deceptions wrought by this mystery of iniquity will be so powerfully seductive that almost everyone will fall for them, especially, and think about this, especially Catholics. Because if Catholics were somehow immune from this deception, what would be the point? (laughs) How could everyone, even almost the elect, be deceived if this deception could easily be seen through by the members of the church? So what better way for the mystery of iniquity to try to overcome the papacy than by taking the Pope out of the way and substituting a false one in his stead? Let's remember, the only way for the forces of Antichrist to succeed for a short time is for the Pope to be taken out of the way and for a new one to be prevented from being elected. And the best way to guarantee that is to make everyone believe that the true Pope is actually reigning when that is not the case. And wouldn't you know it? This is exactly what Father Barry said is foretold in Apocalypse chapter 12. He wrote about this in his 1921 book, The Apocalypse of St. John, which I quoted a few minutes ago. But he also wrote about it in his book, The Church of Christ, published in 1927. Let me give you two quotes, one from The Apocalypse of St. John and the other from The Church of Christ. Quote, It is a matter of history that the most disastrous periods for the church were times when the papal throne was vacant, or when antipopes contended with the legitimate head of the church. Thus also shall it be in those evil days to come. Unquote. And uh, that was from the Apocalypse of St. John, and now the Church of Christ. Quote, the prophecies of the Apocalypse show that Satan will imitate the Church of Christ to deceive mankind. He will set up a church of Satan in opposition to the church of Christ. Antichrist will assume the role of Messiah. His prophet will act the part of Pope. And there will be imitations of the sacraments of the church. There will also be lying wonders in imitation of the miracles wrought in the church. Unquote. So there we have it prophesied. The true church without a pope, opposed by a false church with a false pope, false miracles, and false sacraments. In the end, this false church will also endorse the false messiahs, the Antichrist. This is the operation of error that God will send so that the people who have not loved the truth would instead believe lying. And this operation of error is an integral part of the suffering inflicted upon the church during during her mystical passion. In 1861, the celebrated convert from Anglicanism, Cardinal Henry Edward Manning, 
published a booklet with a series of lectures entitled The Present Crisis of the Holy See Tested by Prophecy, which has recently been reprinted under a different title, The Pope and the Antichrist. I highly recommend it. Again, it's from 1861, far removed from our day, and yet the predictions in there are incredible um, because we have witnessed to a large part the fulfillment of these things. And um, again, the, the title now is The Pope and the Antichrist, and it is published by Traddy Books. You can, um, uh, you can get a copy by going to traddybooks.com. It's T-R-A-D-I Books. Dot com, the Pope and the Antichrist. And if you'd like to have a look at it, just come see me. I'd be happy to. It's, it's, uh, it's only 84 pages, and it's a collection of four lectures. In this little book, Cardinal Manning described in some detail the mystical passion that the church would undergo in the last age of the world, based on the testimony of the church fathers and the best Catholic theological authorities up until that time. So this is, it's not like this was just Cardinal Manning's private opinion or anything. He did the research, and uh, he put it all into these lectures. So the mystical passion of the church was predicted. And the first sign of this passion, Cardinal Manning says, would be an indifference to religious truth. Now keep in mind that his eminence was writing in 1861, a time when the large-scale indifferentism we've lived through in our own day was virtually inconceivable. But he was right. A widespread indifference to truth would indeed be necessary to allow the great apostasy to begin. And as we now know, this was accomplished by means of ecumenism. Ecumenism is the great promoter of indifferentism. If not in theory, most certainly in practice. Its evil fruits are all too visible today. After people have grown indifferent to truth, Cardinal Manning says, the next mark of the church's passion will be a persecution of truth. And the Vatican II Church has been doing exactly that from the beginning. It has persecuted Catholic truth. As a result, secular society has begun to do likewise, and we can see this even in our very own country, where beyond religious truth, even truths of the natural order are now being questioned and persecuted, such as the obvious and empirically verifiable truth that God created man, male and female. Further characteristics of the church's mystical passion, says Cardinal Manning, will be the taking away of the holy sacrifice of the Mass. The setting up of the abomination of desolation in the sanctuary and the temporary overthrow of the papacy. On April 3rd, 1969, the false Pope, Paul VI, suppressed the Catholic Mass, the true Catholic Mass, and instituted the Novus Ordo Misse, the modernist worship service in its stead, the new Mass. And if you look at the Vatican II Church today and how they carry out their highest act of worship, there are only two words that fittingly describe it. Abomination and desolation. During this time when the holy sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation set up, Cardinal Manning says, quote, Then the church shall be scattered, driven into the wilderness, and shall be, for a time, as it was in the beginning, invisible, hidden in catacombs, in dens and mountains, in lurking places. For a time it shall be swept, as it were, from the face of the earth. Such is the universal testimony of the fathers of the early centuries." Unquote. Sound familiar? Next, Cardinal Manning mentions the overthrow of the Roman pontificate, what he calls the casting down of the prince of strength, that is, the divine authority of the church, 
and in particular, the Pope in whom the church's authority is embodied. Quote from Cardinal Manning again. God has invested him, the Pope, with sovereignty and given to him a home and a patrimony on earth. The world is in arms to depose him and to leave him no place to lay his head. Rome and the Roman states are the inheritance of the incarnation. The world is resolved to drive the incarnation off the earth. It will not suffer it to possess so much as to set the sole of its foot upon. The dethronement of the vicar of Christ is the dethronement of the hierarchy of the universal church and the public rejection of the presence and reign of Jesus, unquote. Ladies and gentlemen, as you can see, it was all prophesied. The great apostasy, the great deception, the operation of error, the suppression of the Holy Mass, the overthrow of the Vicar of Christ, it's all there in prophecy, and we've been privileged to witness it. Why do so many people succumb to this deception? Fear, deception, cowardice, human respect. Those are the factors that Cardinal Manning mentions as enabling or accelerating the great apostasy. The last stage in the church's passion is the final persecution, culminating in the apparent death of the church. On this point, Cardinal Manning does not go into a lot of detail, but he does say this, quote, The word of God tells us that towards the end of time, the power of this world will become so irresistible and so triumphant that the church of God will sink underneath its hand. It will be deprived of protection. It will be weakened, baffled, and prostrate, and will lie bleeding at the feet of the powers of this world. The church will seem for a while to be defeated, and the power of the enemies of the faith for a time to prevail. Unquote. This describes the church being mystically entombed, and no doubt that's what we're witnessing now. But although we weep at her sufferings, no less are we assured of her glorious future resurrection. We have to remember always that the church's passion resembles that of her divine spouse. In the words of Cardinal Manning, quote, As the wicked did not prevail against Christ, even when they bound him with cords, dragged him to the judgment, blindfolded his eyes, mocked him as a false king, smote him on the head as a false prophet, led him away, crucified him, and in the mastery of their power seemed to have absolute dominion over him, so that he lay ground down and almost annihilated under their feet. And as at that very time when he was dead and buried out of their sight, he was conqueror over all and rose again the third day and ascended into heaven and was crowned, glorified, and invested with his royalty and reigned supreme, king of kings and lord of lords, even so shall it be with his church. Though for a time persecuted and to the eyes of man overthrown and trampled on, dethroned, despoiled, mocked and crushed, yet in that high time of triumph the gates of hell shall not prevail. There is in store for the church of God a resurrection and an ascension, a royalty and a dominion, a recompense of glory for all it has endured. Like Jesus it needs must suffer on the way to its crown, yet crowned it shall be with him eternally. Let no one then be scandalized if the prophecies speak of sufferings to come. We are fond of imagining triumphs and glories for the church on earth, that the gospel is to be preached to all nations and the world to be converted and all enemies subdued and I know not what, until some ears are impatient of hearing that there is in store for the church a time of terrible trial, 
And so we do as the Jews of old, who looked for a conqueror, a king, and for prosperity. Prosperity. And when their messiahs came in humility and in passion, they did not know him. So I am afraid many among us intoxicate their minds with the visions of success and victory and cannot endure the thought that there is a time of persecution yet to come for the church of God, unquote. These are sobering words, no doubt. They're words of warning, but also words of comfort. Ladies and gentlemen, we've looked at some length now at the mystical passion that Catholic tradition tells us the church will suffer before Christ returns. But did you notice something? Although there is talk of the church being persecuted and apparently defeated, the sanctuary overthrown, the holy mass suppressed, and a pope being kept from being elected or from exercising his office, at no point is there any talk of the true church teaching error, legislating harmful disciplines, promulgating evil sacramental rites, or of the pope himself becoming an enemy of Christ through public heresy or apostasy. In fact, the pope is always mentioned as the victim of the persecution, not its protagonist. And if we remember the church's teachings about the papacy that I quoted at the beginning, this is really not surprising. Theologically, the pope is always the solution, never the problem. According to prophecy, the, the great apostasy is an apostasy from the church and the vicar of Christ, not of the church or the vicar of Christ. As the representative of our Lord, in the church's mystical passion, the pope is being persecuted, not doing the persecuting. The shepherd is struck. He is not doing the striking. Again, this really shouldn't come as a surprise. For example, if we look at the teachings of Pope Pius IX, we see that he describes the coming apostasy as consisting precisely in a failure to adhere to the supreme pontiff and his magisterium. And so Pius IX proposes as the remedy, or as a preventative measure, ever greater fidelity to the Holy See, not resistance against it. Here's a quote from his 1853 encyclical Inter Multiplicis, in which he addresses the bishops of France. Quote, We exhort you to direct your constant efforts so that the faithful people of France may avoid the crafty deceptions and errors of these anti-Catholic plotters and develop a more filial affection and obedience to this apostolic see. Be vigilant in act and word so that the faithful may grow in love for this holy see. Venerate it and accept it with complete obedience. They should execute whatever the see itself teaches, determines, and decrees. Unquote. That is how we prevent or escape the great apostasy, by ensuring we adhere ever more firmly to the Holy See, not by resisting it. And I emphasize this because there are those out there in the anti-city of Acantis to recognize and resist camp, like the Society of St. Pius X, who try to argue that the passion of the church consists in the faithful being persecuted by the pope and the bishops. That's outrageous and certainly not found in prophecy or in Catholic tradition. I could name John Salza and Robert Sisko in particular now, but I won't. <laughs> they believe in what amounts to a self-inflicted passion in which the church basically wounds and persecutes herself, since she obviously consists of both the hierarchy and the laity. These people have tried to argue that just as in our Lord's Passion, the legitimate leaders of the Old Covenant persecuted Christ, so in this mystical Passion, it is the legitimate church leaders of the New Covenant who persecute the body of Christ. What they've missed, though, is that when our Lord was condemned by the Jewish high priest and delivered up to Pontius Pilate, the Jewish authorities had already ceased to be the legitimate leaders of the true religion. Let's have a quick look at St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 26, verses 63 
through 66. And the high priest said to him, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us if thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus saith to him, thou hast said it. Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of the power of God and coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest rent his garments, saying, He hath blasphemed. What further need have we of witnesses? Behold, now you have heard the blasphemy. What think you? But they answering said, He is guilty of death. Now, here's what St. Jerome said about this passage. And keep in mind, St. Jerome is a doctor of the church, and in fact, the church's patron saint of biblical scholars. So he knew what he was talking about. Here's a quote from St. Jerome, and I got this from the Catena Aurea, the uh, scriptural commentary compiled by St. Thomas of Aquinas of all the church fathers' commentaries on the Gospels. St. Jerome, quote, and by, the re- and by this rending of his garments, he, Caiaphas, shows that the Jews have lost the priestly glory and that their high priest's throne was vacant. For by rending his garment, he rent the veil of the law which covered him. Unquote. Caiaphas, the high priest, lost his authority and his office automatically by publicly defecting from the true religion. Sound familiar? The idea that the passion of the church should consist of the Catholic hierarchy misleading the faithful and turning the church from the Ark of Salvation into the Ark of Damnation, with each individual believer needing to figure out for himself just when the church is faithful to Christ and must be submitted to, and when she is apostate, leading souls to hell and must be resisted, both under pain of damnation, is absurd. It's not found in Catholic tradition, it doesn't jibe with Catholic prophecy, and it certainly contradicts church teaching on the papacy and the magisterium. Understanding all these things about the mystical passion of the church and how it was prophesied strengthens us in faith and in hope. Too often we are beaten down with how bad everything is, but we need to remember that we have cause for hope. See, everything seemed hopeless when Christ lay in the tomb, when the disciples and the disciples were perplexed. But then came our Lord's glorious resurrection, which proved that what had appeared to be his great defeat was, in fact, his ultimate victory. So, everything is really going according to plan, so to speak. We are merely witnessing the fulfillment of prophecy. And this is a great privilege that can merit for us many graces. As we are waiting and mourning at the mystical tomb of Holy Mother Church, let us implore God day and night to hasten the day when we will once again have a true Pope. And let us seek refuge in the Immaculate Heart of the Blessed Virgin Mary, secure in the knowledge that in the end, this Immaculate Heart will triumph. If I did not believe God... I would be convinced that the Catholic Church was about to end. Blessed are those who believe God. Thank you.